As you see the title of the next seven mornings and evenings together, this morning and next Sabbath, discovering the heart of God. This is second in the series of studies. And this morning we are going to look very closely at one of the most distorted, one of the most misunderstood pictures within the Christian church. The reality is, is that I've got to turn my cursor on. Thank you. Now it's ready to go. <laughs> I don't know what your background is. Maybe some of you came from an atheist, agnostic, Christian, Jewish. What other religion you can fill in the blank? Somewhere in between. Whatever your belief or your experience about the heart of God, we're going to search for answers together this week. It's no secret. We are living in some very, very crazy times in this world's history. Lots and lots of questions with very few answers. I don't know if you've recognized this lately, but it just seems we are now living in a culture of lies. Who do you believe? Everybody lies. A culture of lies. So we need to go to a source that we can trust. So we're going to see what the Bible has to say about this journey that we call life. I invite you to, if you've got a neighbor, or a friend, or a family member that needs a little bit of a spiritual boost, bring them here. We'd love to have them join us. We're grateful that Lonnie and Jeannie and my brother Rudy, my dear wife Judy, been able to spend this first weekend with you. Lonnie and Jeannie will be with us tonight, and then they're going to be heading back up the road tomorrow. And it's a joy for our family to share our music ministry with you. As we shared last night, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but I've been singing with this family for more than six decades, just put it that way. <laughs> and um, the joy of being in a family that loves good, uplifting music is even better. There's a number of you that are seekers, that are searching for truth. And I'm going to recommend, if you want to take a picture in your phone of this, um, of this slide, there's three sources that I'd love to suggest. If, you've, if you're at home and, and you're studying the Bible or you have some questions, not only are there people here in this church that would be willing to come out and have a Bible study with you. We've got a number of individuals in this church that they love doing that. But maybe you want to spend some time, you know, on your computer. Some great Bible resources. My brother Lonnie was affiliated with the Voice of Prophecy for many years, almost 19 years while he was there they developed the discover bible school these are online lessons they even have a version for kids now the kids that took up that lamb's offering a little bit ago these are some of the most if your parents are concerned about the social media and, and the time your kids waste on the computer get them to waste time at kids zone it's a great resource to learn truths from the scripture Another great resource is through Amazing Facts. Uh, many of you are familiar with the name Doug Batchelor. Uh, if you've ever read his testimony of living as a nudist in a cave above uh, the Palm Springs, finding a Bible and finding Jesus. And now he's become an incredible evangelist, an incredible soul winner. Amazingfacts.org. And then the gentleman that helped me put together some of these slides and some of these messages, his name is... Merlin Bierman, and his website is bible-lessons.org. Those just are a few resources for you to maybe help you in this journey. Now, we opened last night with a, with a gospel concert with the five of us, and I think we learned some very exciting and thrilling things that are happening in parts of this world, miraculous things that are taking place in that area known as the 1040 window. Testimonies that describe the heart of God. The discovering the heart of God. This is a God who wants to be known and loved 
by people in every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. That's his heart. And so this series is entitled Discovering the Heart of God. Discover the Heart of God. There's a lot of differing opinions as we sit here this morning about the character of God. During these next eight sessions, we're going to look very carefully at what the Bible says about the heart of God. We're going to try to clear up some of the misconceptions that exist. Right now, though, I um, had a little bit of a rough night last night. I just need an extra dose of God's grace and presence in my life. Would you bow your heads with me? And as I pray, would you lift a prayer up as well? Lord, right now, we come before you just deeply in love with you and your son, Jesus. We live in a crazy world with a lot of questions, but very few answers. Lord, this morning, we want to try to discover the heart of God and discover how much he loves us. Thank you for this church, those visiting here this morning. Just send your presence here now, we pray in your name. Amen. In the book of John 17, verse 3, we read these words. And this is eternal life, do you mean that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now, if that's true, then the opposite would be true as well. That the lack of, of the true knowledge of the heart of God would lead to what? Eternal death. Our perception of God, the heart of God, will ultimately determine our eternal destiny. So I think it's very important what we believe about him. The, um, I'm just going to take a minute or two right now to kind of give us an overview of the first few half of these Bible studies because it, it's a continuation. You, you can't just take and separate one topic and not deal with another. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview of what's going to happen in the next few nights. Tonight at 7 o'clock, how to determine credible sources of information. Is the Bible really what many claim it to be? Got some incredible archaeological, uh, historical facts that we're going to share with you tonight. The title is, Can We Trust a Two-Edged Sword? We'll look into fulfilled prophecy, archaeology, other evidence that shows that we can 100% trust, rely on God's word as truth. Tomorrow night, we'll look closely at what the Bible says about the warning signs, signs that you can't ignore. Tuesday night, we'll answer the question that so many have asked, why? Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Why does God allow suffering? Our message this morning you call, would you rather be accused of murder? The question for you this morning is this. Many have a concept of God as this merciless judge, this tyrant. He's, he's just eagerly watching and waiting to catch you do something wrong. And then he's going to write it down in a book of life. And, and uh, you know, here's Jody and walking along. Here's the two tables of stone. And, uh, you know, I do something. <laughs> Dust him off. That actually is the way many people see God. Has his character been assassinated? You know, character assassination is something we take very seriously. We see it happening all around us. So today we are going to, to seek to discover God's true character. I want you to imagine for a minute being falsely accused of one of the worst imaginable crimes that your mind can come up with. The violent sexual assault of your own children. Imagine receiving unjustly a sentence of 212 years for this crime that you did not commit. 
You got your mind around that idea? This is a true story. It's a story of a police officer who experienced this exact situation. I want you to imagine yourself in his place. I want you to meet Ray Spencer. A little triangle back there, it's not a movie. I just grabbed the picture off of the internet and that's the only thing I could find. But I want you to meet Ray Spencer. He's the victim behind this crime, behind this story. Now, Ray served on the police force in Clark County, Southwest Washington, an area in Vancouver, Meadow Glade, where I worked for many years, know the area well. So this is what caught my attention when it appeared on, on the television program, 60 Minutes. In 1979, Ray and his wife, Deanna, went through a divorce. And after the divorce, their children visited their father a couple times a year. Even though he had failed miserably as a, as a husband, Ray was known as a just a loving, wonderful, fun-loving father. He had suffered under an abusive alcoholic father himself, but he, was, he still tried, strived to be a good father to his children. And on their limited visits, he would take the kids camping and fishing and playing and do the things that kids love to do. But then in 1984, a few years after his divorce, he remarried, and now Ray lived with his second wife, Shirley, and her young son. And he soon came to know the true Shirley, one who had a very volatile and a very violent, vicious temperament. And in August of that same year, Ray left. He left the children with Shirley while he attended a police academy, a, a police conference, continuing Ed out of town. Little did Ray know that this would be the last time he'd be with his children for 22 years. You see, when he returned from the trip, Shirley acted really weird, really despondent. She said that her daughter Katie had said that her daddy had sexually abused her. And like the heart of any father, any loving father would be, Ray was devastated here it was happening to his precious little daughter. Because when she said daddy that had done these things, he, he knew that he wasn't guilty, so he just assumed that it was the boyfriend of his first wife that was guilty. Well, with the unbridled determination of a police officer and of a loving father and the know-how of how the police force works, Ray shifted into policeman mode. And he immediately reported the incident to the sheriff's office where they worked with the Child Protective Services. Ray was soon mortified to learn that he was prime suspect number one. Now these accusations, they led to his layoff from work and ultimately to one of the most corrupt police investigation in Washington state history. Now it was easy for his first wife to be believe the lies because of her hatred toward Ray and his, her resentment toward him for his unfaithfulness. And she was convinced that he was guilty even after having Katie and, and Matt, the other child, examined by a doctor. The, the doctor had documented that there was absolutely no evidence of any sexual abuse. But Shirley had convinced herself that the kids just didn't remember. And then she pressured them to testify against him. The investigator that was given this case, her name was Joy Krause. She was new to the department and she saw this case as the opportunity she needed to make a name for herself. And so she began making questionable trips to see the children. And in her interaction with the children, she didn't follow protocol as the way the law dictates. She tried everything she could to get the testimony that she wanted from Katie and her brother. She even took them to her hotel room and spent hours trying to manipulate their thinking since the children weren't saying 
weren't saying what she wanted she and her mother to hear. You follow the, you follow the plot so far? So they began not only to manipulate the kids, but to threaten and bribe them. And under extreme pressure, the kids finally gave in and said with the officer what, they wanted, what the mother wanted to hear. And these false testimonies from the children put their dad in prison. Now, this investigator conveniently misplaced a video that showed the truth. And because of this investigation, obviously, Ray was fired from his position as a police officer. And during this time, he spent countless hours thinking nothing about his innocence. And he came to a breaking point where he came to a place where he pulled out his 357 Magnum his revolver, and he was going to forever end everything. But a voice spoke to him and said, Ray, for the sake of your children, this is not the answer. Ray sought medical help, psychiatric help. But he soon found himself with other problems. The physicians examined him, put him on drugs for his suicidal thoughts. And in the meantime, he gets accused now of abusing his stepson as well. The drugs that he was taking were messing with his mind and his brain to the point where Ray began to doubt his own innocence. He questioned himself. Did I molest these kids? Did, did I do this? Did, but I just can't remember. If it's true, he said, then I, then I deserve to be locked up. And so to help find the truth, he agreed to go to undergo hypnosis and to take a truth serum, a drug. The tests came back negative with absolutely no sign of Ray being guilty. And now Ray, <laughs> he no longer doubted his, doubted his innocence. But the state of Washington believed differently. Ray had pulled all of his money they had in saving to, to fund a good defense attorney. The unsigned check disappeared while he was in custody. And at the trial, his court-appointed lawyer had done absolutely nothing, nothing in preparation. Now, I see Lenore here doing this, her dear husband who passed away a number of years ago. He was a judge in what county? Yeah. Terry Finney, look up his name. Wonderful human being. Christian judge. Need more of those in this world. So this attorney had done absolutely no preparation. Ray absolutely collapsed into the arms of the guards when the judge gave him a sentence of 212 years in prison with no possibility of a parole. So now Ray's in prison. False charges that absolutely assassinated not only his character, but his, his life and his, his family and everything that he loved. Now you have to understand this. To be convicted as a child molester puts you on the lowest pecking order among inmates. I mean, you are, it's a death warrant, put it that way. So he would spend the next two decades being incarcerated, move from one prison to another to another just to, to preserve his life. I don't know what that does to your heart, but that vexes my spirit. Friends, there's another case of character assassination of an innocent father. I think you know where I'm going with this. Baylor University did a large survey to see what perception of God's character, what do people think God's character is like here in America? 
And so about 5% of them were atheists or agnostic, which surprised me. I thought it'd be a much larger percentage than that. 32% believe in an authoritarian God. That's believing God to be very judgmental, angry, anxious to punish. Another 16% that God is critical. He does not interfere now, but he will judge and he'll punish people in the afterlife. And then the next group, the 24%, said God was very distant and uninvolved. This God is like a cosmic force that he listens and he responds to prayers and he cares deeply. But he also believes he's the direct cause of our suffering and pain. Now, a category that they left out, unfortunately, and I think is the most important one, is those who believe that God is always loving, that he's just and merciful, who doesn't directly cause our suffering. That category was not included. But friends, just like Ray Spencer's accusers, the enemy, Satan, has slandered God's character, and as a result, misshaped the beliefs and molded the actions of millions upon millions of people. It's an unfortunate fact. Most Americans have a misunderstanding of the heart of God. They have an inaccurate picture of his heart of love. I'll give you one very prime example. Any of you involved in insurance know what I'm talking about. I don't care if you've got a car insurance or your home insurance or your business. Every insurance policy has a clause of certain things that are excluded from coverage, and these are called acts of God. Acts of God. So this is hurricanes, tornadoes, earthquakes, floods, tsunamis, you see, God is up there in his celestial computer, and he pushes this button, and he wants a hurricane to happen over here, and an earthquake over here, and destruction over here. These acts of God, they won't cover. Well, you know what, friends? If that was an accurate picture of God, I wouldn't be too convinced either. So many don't want to believe in him or get to know him if he does exist in this realm. I, I don't want to get sidetracked, but there was a time in my journey where I would have nightmares at night. I'd wake up, the, the Lord has returned, and I had forgotten about one sin that I hadn't asked for forgiveness. <laughs> Jody's blown away. I didn't see God in a very loving picture. I want us to look at scripture this morning to see if we can discover what God is really like. What is his heart really like? Now, this is what our enemy, the enemy of our souls, this is what he wants us to believe in and how to act. And this is found in Micah 7, 17. They shall lick the dust like serpent, like the crawling things of earth. They shall come tr trembling out of their strongholds. They shall turn in dread to the Lord our God and they shall be in fear of you. Hmm. But you know what? When people believe that characteristic of God, the enemy of our soul, Satan, he laughs when we act the way that is described in this verse. But if you go to the very next verse, we read the real heart of God. Micah 7, 18 and 19. Who is God like you? Pardoning iniquity? passing over transgression for the remnant of the inheritance. He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. He will have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all your sins into the depths of the sea. Now, don't you like that one? But like Ray Spencer, like his kids, Many of us are guilty of being manipulated to believe and perpetuate the lies of the enemy, the enemy of souls. God's character is a character of love. 
And I'd like to suggest there are four main characteristics of his government. And we find these found in the book of Psalms. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Did you get that? Did you get that? Righteousness and justice, mercy and love, mercy and truth. God's love has been expressed in these characteristics. Justice is the foundation of his throne. Ray Spencer did not receive justice. But in God's world, justice is the foundation, and it's the fruit of his love to mankind. And Satan has tried for now how many millennia to pin his characteristics on God. Insurance companies need to rename it Acts of Satan. His own wicked character, he tries to pin those characteristics on God. And I realize, I realize as we sit here this morning, that there are records in the Old Testament that would cause one to question God's character of love. I don't need to go into any details, but there are some stories in the Old Testament that get you scratching your head. Had a studying a Bible, having a Bible study with, with a seeker of truth. And he says, you know, I don't really like the God of the Old Testament, but I love Jesus of the New Testament. But yet Jesus says, if you've seen me, we'll get to that in a minute. I had an Old Testament theologian, teacher, one very versed in, old, in biblical languages, ancient Hebrew and, and Greek and so forth, to help me understand some of these illustrations in the Old Testament that cause one to be troubled. And he said, Jody, the way the historians wrote down the record, the scribes, those that, that, that wrote the records in the Old Testament, in their culture, their mindset went like this. If God allowed it, he did it. What God allows, he does. To kind of put it in a practical sense, I see some children here this morning, love kids. Let's, let's say the parent of one of the little girls here is five years old. Mommy, mommy, can I go ride my tricycle out in the street? Well, yeah, you, you can do that. Daddy, can I, can I take my basketball and go, go play hoops with... And the little girl that's now riding her bicycle in the street gets hit by a car and gets seriously injured. Are the mom or dad directly accused? Are they directly involved in that injury? No. It's just part of the circumstance of life. Little boy playing basketball. He falls, breaks his leg. Dad is responsible because he let him do it. Do you get the picture? That's the way many of the Old Testament stories, that's the way the historians recorded them. And the unbelievable thing about it is God allows Satan to distort his character, but he wants us to come to a true picture of how he really is. I want, you to, I want us to dig a little bit deeper for a few more minutes and see what God's heart is really like. Book of John, John 4, 24, it says God is spirit. That God is spirit is important, but it doesn't tell us much about the possibility of getting to know him. The Bible also says in 1 John 1, 5, God is light, and in him, no darkness at all. Hmm. Now, this is, this is intellectually intriguing, because the thought of an all-pure, all-seeing God... What good can such a God find in our rebellious, sinful hearts? In light of who and what we are? So the definition of God that is so plain, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 16, God is love. Everybody quotes that. God is good all the time, all the time God is good. And yes, this is the most comprehensive yet simple definition of God. His nature is a heart of love and will never change. 
He tells us in in his word, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you in Jeremiah 31.3. Did you get that everlasting love? This implies that there's not ever been a time when he has not been or will not be loved. That his love has existed from eternity. But without divine revelation to our spiritually blind eyes, we could never make this discovery for ourselves. This revelation to me is supremely important that we learn that God is love and that fear is replaced by trust. We can confidently place ourselves in the hands of our Heavenly Father, knowing that He cares for us. His incarnation, we celebrate that, you know, at Christmas time. Coming into this world as this baby, this human in a manger, we call this the mystery of, of the incarnation of godliness. God, He made a way that we can be rescued from our rebellion and paths to etern- and, and give us paths to eternal life. Throughout these meetings that we're going to be having together, We're going to look deeply into the mystery of godliness to see the unimaginable gift. The gift that God gave to save the the entire planet Earth. God has pronounced a beautiful future and a wonderful hope for those who choose it. Now, some of you might ask, so on a practical level, What are these characteristics of love, these characteristics of God, since you say that he is love? Well, I've taken little liberties here. You know, the Apostle Paul, in in his letter to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 13, he describes love this way. We know this chapter well. Love love suffers long. It does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It doesn't behave rudely. does not seek its own, is not provoked. We love those words. Thinks no evil, does, it does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So, here's a little bit of um, paraphrasing that I'm going to do. If, as we discovered from 1 John, that God is love, where it says love in that letter from Paul in 1 Corinthians, we can paraphrase and insert the name God. So this is now what that verse would sound like. God suffers long. He is kind. God does not envy. God does not parade himself. God is not puffed up. He does not behave rudely. He does not seek its own. He is not provoked. Don't you love that? He thinks no evil. He does, he does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in In truth, he bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things, endures all things. God never fails. I don't know what that does to you, but boy, that gives me a very, very clear picture of the character of God. Many have been taught and believe the lie about God's character, this vengeful God. That is the way the enemy of our souls wants us to see God as a God who sits up there, stern, angry God, just can't wait to catch us making a mistake. Serve him from fear. Now I understand that it may take a while for us to get to know and understand this God with the heart of love and trust him and not fear him. That's the way the enemy wants us to see God, to serve him from fear. But this is, my friends, why it's so important. If you want to start a devotional experience in the beginning of 2023, I encourage you to take and read over and over the four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we can see a clear picture of God's heart and his heart of love and compassion. But, you know, we as human beings may not be too smart sometime. Here you have the disciples. And I've often 
meditative thought about that. If I could have walked, if I could have talked, if I could have been right there with Jesus, seen him heal the sick and, and raise the dead and give sight to the blind and hearing to, oh, I, I'm done. I mean, that's it. That's all I need. Well, the disciples, these guys had walked and talked with Jesus for over three years, watching him do all these miracles. Even they didn't get it. In 1 John, or in John 14, 8, we read an account of one of the disciples, Philip, who has this encounter with Jesus. He says, Lord, show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. That's, that's all we need. And what does Jesus say? Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, and this is it right here, friends. This is the ringer. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. That's why I love reading the accounts of Jesus. I'm going to encourage you. We have a whole supply. If you go to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., the book that is recommended number one on their list of books on the life of Christ is a book entitled Desire of Ages. It is the most complete story of the life of Jesus through the pen of inspiration. I've read that book numerous times, and I just can't get enough of, of Jesus and his love for us and how he interacted with people. His encounters with the people and how he treated them definitely describe God as a God whose heart is full of love and compassion for his people. I don't know about you, but wouldn't you just all, all want to be on the receiving end of that kind of love, of that kind of, of incredible devotion, to be treated with long suffering? Well, I tell you what, there are times that I, I'm not real long suffering. We live in the Phoenix area, and I don't know about down here, but I think Phoenix has attracted all the craziest, wackiest drivers in the planet. And I don't have a whole lot of long suffering. You know, some of these, you get the picture, don't you? God deals us with patience, kindness, not treated rudely or judged unfairly. I long to be cared for and to be believed in, to be valued for the unlimited potential that God has put in my life, that he's created in us. To be the center of someone's love and hope. That's a clear picture of who God is. Though sin has corrupted his character, we still desire love because that's the way God created us. And when we realize this perfect love, I want you to look what, what's cast out of our minds concerning him. You know this verse in 1 John 4, 8. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. I don't want to be trite, but you know, there are some people who claim to be Christians. They've had the hell scared out of them. They're fearful. They see a God who is not a God. My friends, let's insert the word God into this verse where it says love and read it. There's no fear in God, but our perfect God casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. Fear is gone. In, all, in spite of all the craziness in this world that they're in, and I'm going to pause the last three years. Have you noticed um, the fear that exists in America. And that fear has resulted in our, I mean, look at all the freedoms that we have lost. In just a matter of a few years, freedom to assemble, freedom of speech, freedom of, how about our freedom of conscience? You know, my, you know, if I go into the military and I go as a conscientious objector, they'll go to the Supreme Court to honor my my conscientious objection. But what about all those millions of people in America that have said, you know, 
I'm not too convinced, and I'm not here to talk about the effectiveness or the ineffectiveness of the jab. What I'm saying is, what has happened to our freedom of choice? What has happened to my, my freedom to say, you know, I don't think I want to do that. I'll stay off of that or I'll get myself in trouble. <laughs> but here's the deal, my friends. I'm living a life, I don't, I don't fear the future. Because I only fear it except I forget the way God has led us in the past. Perfect love casts out fear. Exodus 34, 6, to 6 and 7. The Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Isn't it amazing how the devil has deceived so many into thinking that God is a, a character to fear? Friends, it couldn't be more opposite. Praise the Lord. Now let's take just a few more minutes now to learn about the most powerful force in the universe, this force of love. I love this verse in the Song of Solomon. There's so many little, you know, there, there's so many little verses in the Song of Solomon that are like bumper stickers, you know, just short and concise. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can flood, floods drown it. This is the heart of God who created you and who loves you. But who should we fear? We should fear the enemy. He's a sneaky one. Deception is his middle name. So the question as we close, how can, how can I believe, Jody, what you're telling me about God's character if I can't see him? Again, this is where we find the Gospels, a perfect picture of God. God anointed Jesus as Nazareth, Nazareth, the Holy Spirit, with power, who went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Going about doing good. Christ's mission and the mission of all who follow him in their heart will be to reach out to others, to share the good news with, with your neighbors and your friends. Open the scriptures and read the gospels again that gives you this true picture of the heart of God. Mentioned last night. Be surprised. Many who, who see a true picture of God will come to an understanding that um, the entrance into heaven is not based on the sins that we have or have not committed. Those who gain or miss heaven are judged on the love that God has put in their heart and how they act upon it. How do they respond to that love? Now, there are a few exceptions. A thief on the cross. I didn't come up with this scenario, but I just, I have to share it with you. I'll probably share it again during this week. Here's a thief on the cross. His last conscious moments are Jesus dying on the cross and Jesus saying to him, I say to you today, you'll be with me in paradise. He dies. We'll be talking about the, the resurrection and heaven and second coming in one of our future lectures. But now, all those who've been faithful, those who've died, those who are living in Christ at the second coming, they're there in heaven. And the first conscience thought now of this thief on the cross, he's, he's in his criminal garb. He, he, he knows that he's been a wicked, wicked person. And someone turns to him and says, How, why are you here? The man in the middle invited me. The man in the middle invited me. That gives you a picture of the heart of God. That thief didn't deserve the reward. The man in the middle invited me. So it's how, but as we live our life now, as we journey through this crazy world, the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you took me. And I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. That is why I'm so, so grateful that I belong to a church family that we reach out. We don't just talk about Jesus. We have ways of ministering to people by helping them through our community services and, and, and offering them ways to live a better life here in this journey. Notice Jesus, his words. He doesn't commend his faithful for how many times they've read their Bible from cover to cover or how many times they went to church or, or how much they gave in their tithes and offerings or, or for any of their brilliance or, or their intellect or their eloquent speech. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. But it's for doing those little things that may have been missed by everyone but God. Love's excellent way that decides our eternal destiny. I know our time is creeping up, but I gotta tell you a little story. I was a youth pastor. That's why I'm not an eloquent speak, speaker. I just, I speak like I'm talking to kids. That's the way I do it. And um, I love this story. This little five-year-old boy, he's with his parents at the airport and they're making a trip to Disney World. And he had never been on an airplane before, but he absolutely loved airplanes. He had books, coloring books of every kind of airplane. He had puzzles. He had models of airplanes. He'd look up in the sky and he could tell his dad, that's a, that's a 747 and that's a 737. You know, this little kid loved airplanes. So they're waiting in the airport for their plane to board and they get the bad news that the plane is being delayed by several hours. Oh my, this anxious ADD kid needed something to do. So mom goes down to the little shopping center there in the airport and buys him this pretty large jigsaw puzzle of a 747 airline in flight. And now little Johnny, oh, he dumps that thing on the floor right there in the waiting room and he mixes up the pieces and his sister wants to come and help him and he says, no, I ought to do it by myself. And so piece by piece, Johnny puts that puzzle together. He finally gets it done. And he's so proud of the fact that he'd done it all by himself. He gets his hand under that little cardboard frame and he starts walking over to show it to his mom and dad. Mommy, daddy, look at, I did this all by myself. And as he turns, a pilot who is running late for his flight runs smack dab into little Johnny, knocks the puzzle out of his hand, it goes all over the floor. The tears, they come to Johnny, get me, you know, the little boys are, he didn't want to, and so he kneels down and he starts putting all the pieces together and this pilot, gray haired, gray mustache, he turns to his friend, he says, Fred, I'll catch you in Orlando. And that pilot, he kneels down there and starts putting all the pieces. And he helps little Johnny put that puzzle back together. Without saying a word, he hands it to Johnny. Johnny, now those tears, they're replaced with a big smile. Pardon me, I'm a soft touch. And he goes up to his mom and dad. He said, Mommy, look, did you see that man? Did you see that man? Was that Jesus? Was that Jesus? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I don't know about you, but in my journey, I want people to see Jesus in me. I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit. Because I want to get to the rest of the story. As Paul Harvey would say. So... We know that the most ultimate act of love is shown on Calvary. 
Greater love has no man than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. God in himself, he displayed that incredible gift at Calvary. So now the rest of the story. Remember Paul Harvey used to have that great broadcast? It's now Christmas Eve 2004. And little Katie, five, six-year-old Katie, is now married and in her mid-twenties. And while sitting with her family around the Christmas tree on Christmas Eve, the phone rings, and it's Katie's dad. He, he was, she was told that Katie's dad, Ray, was being released from prison. What? Katie barely knew her dad. But his life was a mystery to her. So her mom, Deanne, with the news, she called that he was now being released after more than 20 years in prison. Katie barely knew him, but his life was always a mystery to her. She hadn't seen him since he was, she was six years old when she was manipulated into accusing him of molesting her. She was actually the reason that he could never see the light of day out of prison. But she, could, she just couldn't make sense of her earliest childhood memories. She didn't even know her own emotions. Should she be glad? Should she be terrified that Ray is now free? Her mom had always told her that if her dad was ever released, that he would come for, for revenge. And now years later, a new relentless defense team discovered some very disturbing flaws in the initial investigation. This supposedly misplaced videotape and the medical reports were all discovered. And these clearly showed that Ray had been the victim of a devastating lies that assassinated not only his character but sent him to prison. The videotape revealed clearly that Katie's testimony had been manipulated. The hidden, re hidden doctor's reports were testified that there was absolutely no physical evidence of any sexual abuse of the children. And so for 10 years, a hired private investigator had been relentlessly seeking out truth to seek Ray's freedom. There was a series of blatant injustices kept haunting Ray and preventing him from, from this release. And, and for all these years, Katie and her brother. They didn't know the full story. They only knew their mother's version of what she had told them, that her dad was sick and had done some horrible things to them. And as they grew older, they became convinced of their dad's innocence. It carried tremendous guilt with them. And now many years later, this deeper investigation revealed convoluted this web of lies and injustice and with all these details being uncovered, the motives for the unjust defamation of Ray's character became obvious. You see, just a few days before Ray's trial, Shirley, Ray's wife, had pressured him to sign over all of her, all of his business, the home, everything. And that money that was supposed to be used for Ray's defense mysteriously showed up in her bank account. And it was revealed when the accusations against Ray had started that Ray's wife was having an affair with the chief supervisor of the investigation, the sheriff's office, Mike Davidson. And the two of them carried out this plot to assassinate Ray's character to cover their own immoral behavior. And shortly after Ray was sent to prison, Shirley had made their immorality even more apparent by moving in with Mr. Davidson. Pretty sick. And the investigation under and the supervision of Mr. Davison pressured to hide that tape that would have dismissed the case. Manipulating the children's statements to give Ray the appearance of guilt, these lies not only destroyed Ray's reputation, but he lost many years of his life. But worst of all, it kept the children from being wanting to pursue a relationship with their innocent, loving father. The title of my sermon comes from an interview that Ray had with 60 Minutes. Ray said that his pain was so great, I would have rather been accused of murder 
been accused of abusing my children. I can identify with that. And after his relief, of course, it took some time, but Ray eventually was able to communicate, reestablish a relationship with his kids. And he had convinced them long ago that he had forgiven them for the past, for the part that they played. During his many years in prison, he longed for a relationship with his kids. And it finally happened. Fathers, can you even begin to imagine this nightmare? I don't know what this does to you, but the story of this injustice just disgusts me. I can't even describe the outrageous feelings that I, that I have towards this kind of injustice. And I think you know where I'm going with this as we close. Because there is a very similar drama taking place right now in which you and I are involved. And this story is the character assassination that began thousands of years ago in heaven like Ray Spencer, our Heavenly Father, was accused, falsely accused, of abusing his children. And Lucer, who, led, who was that leading age, he made these devastating accusations about God and then manipulated a third of those heavenly angels to believe it. I guess my question this morning is, are we like Kate and, and Matt, victims that we've been manip manipulated to believe lies of abuse? And even when he used his evil character to, in, to inflict pain on the heart of God and further assassinate his character, for the past 6,000 years of known history, he has been guilty of defacing and distorting and mischaracterizing the heart of God, this character of love. Will his innocence be vindicated in our minds? I pray so. Will we believe in his innocence as proven at the cross? Will we stop the cycle of assassination of his character? God loves us too much to take away our freedom and force his, and force his love on us. He gives us freedom of choice as he did in, even in heaven. That's God's ultimate law of the universe. So this morning, I don't know about you, the Bible reveals that Christ would have died for just one sinner. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who he did not spare his own life, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give all things? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. This morning, I don't know about you, but I'm glad that the Bible gives us so many clear pictures of the true character of God. And this morning as we begin the new year, I'd like to encourage all of us to take time daily. Take time daily to seek and know this God of love. Heavenly Father, we've just touched the tip of the iceberg now. <laughs> We pray that you will smile down on us this new year with heaven's choicest blessings every day to see that God is so wonderful. May we express that on our expressions and what we say and how we live to those of our friends and our families. We have kind words often for the stranger, sweet thoughts for the sometime guest, but often for our own there's the bitter tone, though we love our own the best. Please help us. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.